Well, good afternoon and uh, welcome to our tree farm. I want to thank you for joining us and I want to be sure to thank uh, Parker Johnson who's here from Clemson University Extension to help me get this film done and talk a little bit about forestry and tree farming and how it rates, relates to the Society of American Foresters. There are a lot of analogies there and similarities there that I think will be good to accomplish my task of talking about my vision for forestry and uh, who am I and where am I and uh, what do I do? We're in a, a natural stand right here that was uh, left by the previous owner before we bought it in 1991. And we've retained that stand adjacent to the highway, which you can hear some traffic in the background. And it kind of is a parallel to me between having perhaps an occupation, which is non-professional, like forestry or liking to work with trees versus a profession of forestry which takes a lot of skill levels and knowledge base and uh, certification to actually become a forester. So we'll talk about how you can move from a natural stand or just an occupation forestry to a very highly productive tree farm or forest that's managed by a professional forester and be a lot more productive, actually take better care of the environment along the way and it, uh, produce societal values that we all like to do. SAS vision is, uh, in just a few words, is excellence in sustainable forestry. And the mission is to do that for society in perpetuity. And that's what we in forestry do. We don't necessarily live long enough to see all the things that come to fruition, but we always want to make it a little bit better for the next generation. We purchased about 70 acres thinking one day we'd move back here to uh, retire and do our forestry on our land. And we were very blessed to have had that opportunity in 1992 to move here and started uh, working with the forest. Came up through the highway just behind me and the uh, only way to get in, there was no access roads, was to cut a trail with a chainsaw. And we did that, created an entrance into the forest. Now we have uh, a very uh, intensively managed forest. We've been here for 29 years, and we have not only the forest, but we have the aesthetics and the opportunity for recreation and wildlife and scenic beauty as well on this 70 acres with about uh, 35 acres that was planted in plantation pine in 1974 we've been able to manage that and the rest of the forest along the way okay one more thing before we leave this spot is the one to mention this pine that I'm standing beside it's a uh, little over two feet in diameter probably 27 inches or so we know from other trees that are here that have been falling down and we took a cross section of it the trees in this corridor right here are believe it or not somewhere in the 80 to 90 plus years old range maybe even close to a hundred and uh, this is what you get in a natural upland pine stand, a mixed pine and hardwood stand here in the coastal plain of South Carolina. And what we'll try to do is differentiate between this tree that took about 100 years to grow and growing maybe a ton or two of wood per acre per year to a planted environment, a more uh, aggressively managed environment where you can grow many tons per acre per year and increase your uh, rate of return. And once you've got everything established for your uh, tree farm, if you choose to, to join that organization and have sought out some assistance from a professional forester, which you always advise that activity to make sure that uh, you're doing things properly and most productively and uh, within the constraints there are maybe laws, regulations, that sort of thing. You can uh, enhance your property by creating a nice entrance gate well, for security and also uh, the ability to set it up in uh, an LLC, a limited liability corporation like Walnut Bluff, you see the name over here. We set that up so that we could protect ourselves just like Society of American Foresters does with the proper administration, proper legal advice and that sort of thing so that you can uh, accomplish what you want to accomplish with the least liability and the least risk to your property and to your family and to your assets. Okay, well now we've moved a little bit away from the uh, roadside and the natural pine hardwood stand that you looked at just a minute ago and the entrance gate and you're looking in the other direction, roughly an easterly direction. And the area that I'm standing in and the area behind me was where a portion of the 1974 pine plantation was. And of course we harvested those trees, they were 42 years old, harvested in 2016, so they're not here anymore. And what we did when we came back, we were going to reforest the pine plantation, but along the way we wanted a little bit more room for aesthetics, for wildlife food plantings, and uh, just a little bit more of a vista. 
So we created this opening that you see here that extends all the way to the planted pines over my right shoulder and all the way around to my left you see the a pond and over towards where the home is. We created this opening and we've named it Karen's Meadow. We have some signs around. We've named it for uh, some family members as well as for the attributes that might be on the ground. And this illustrates why non-industrial private landowners like myself, which average about 80 acres or so here in South Carolina in size, there are a variety of reasons that they might own land. And timber can be a big portion of that or not a big portion of their reason to own. Typically it's down the list, maybe third, fourth, or fifth of the typical non-imposed industrial private landowner. They will own the land for a variety of reasons, for creating a legacy for those in the future, generating an asset that they can leave to their children and, or other family members. They like wildlife either to sightsee or to view or to hunt. They may fish if that opportunity is available in that particular portion of land. So there are a variety of reasons. And uh, just like uh, within uh, SAF, there are a variety of reasons you might want to be a forester. And this is just one of them to change the, uh, the landscape to a more productive landscape. What we're going to try to do here is to stick with that goal of excellence in sustainable forestry for society and perpetuity. And we're doing the very best we can to leave it better than we found it. Okay, we moved a little bit now and uh, came up from Karen's Meadow and the little basin there and the pond to what's about the highest spot on the track at about 65 feet above sea level. You can see that uh, to your right, my left, we cleared out about two acres, built our home there in 1992 and been living there ever since. And um, I mentioned that the Loblolly Pine Forest, Pine uh, Loblaw Pine Plantation that was here was harvested 2016 and uh, all those trees were removed and replanted where we wanted to replant except for these three. This one to here and then a couple back here. But this one's pretty cool. It's about 27 inches in diameter and uh, close to 100 feet tall and it shows you what would have been here and what was here when we harvested the trees that were here. You recall that I showed you a tree over here that was close to a hundred year old loblolly pond in the natural stand. So you can contrast growing tree that might be uh, 27 inches in diameter for 80, 90, 100 years or you can grow that in about 40 some years. And if you do the math on that, your internal rate of return or your uh, interest rate on your money is much, much better growing that volume on less acres, on, excuse me, over less time. And um, to the right, you see the home site, that's the two acres or so. Something that's really interesting, I think, is to know where you come from. Kind of like SAF, we know where we came from. Gifford Pinchot, 1900, started the organization and uh, really set us off on the right track. We continue to be with the leadership that we have within the association and the membership that we have. And forestry, we not only understand the forest, but we also have to understand the soils and the geology and all the things that give us what we have to work with as far as forestry goes. So it's interesting to note that we're at about 65 feet above sea level here. The lowest level on our property is in the swamp that's down to the uh, south, and we'll go look at that in just a second, to about 30 feet in elevation. And for you folks that are in the mountains, you're gonna say 65 feet above sea level, that's not very much. Well, it is a lot if that's what you got to work with. Columbia, South Carolina, the middle of the state where the capital is, is about 300 feet above sea level. And the mountains, 3,553 feet is the highest point in South Carolina. The ocean used to be at Columbia, around 300 feet above sea level. So Charleston, South Carolina would have been under 300 feet of water back tens of millions of years ago when the ocean was there. As the ocean receded back to where it is currently around Charleston, it stopped. And where it did, it created what we have here. And this is multiple places across the coastal plain. Sandbar, believe it or not, we're standing on a sandbar that would have been here tens of millions of years ago, 65 feet above sea level. And nowadays, that's where we're gonna to want to build our house, right on top of that hill. Okay, now we've moved down off the sandbar 
the 65 feet above sea level area where the house is. We came down to transition area that we talked about. Now we're on the edge of the pine hardwood area. It's a, somewhat of a colloquial term for areas that are pine and hardwood mix. Very common in natural stands in the coastal plain. And behind me, black walnut. We just had one of these drop off a tree here right close, right between me and, <laughs> and uh, Parker. So we want to not get hit in the head with this because it would hurt. But uh, they're all over the ground here. Uh, that's why we named this Walnut Bluff because we have the bluff adjacent to the swamp and quite a few walnuts, which is interesting because most of the area down here is pine flatwoods. But, and this is where we talk a little bit about how uh, climate and landforms change over time. And in this particular case, this would have been tens of millions of years ago, a sandbar, and right behind me was a saltwater bay, if you can imagine that, that went from miles and miles, probably 10 to 15 miles to the next ridge that was on the other side. So it was a saltwater bay. We have evidence of that in this bank right here. There's all evidence of old oyster shells and fossils and that sort of thing. So we know that actually happened. And over time, not necessarily a long time, about 7,000 years ago, <clears throat> The southern pine belt that runs roughly from, uh, say, Virginia or so all the way over to Louisiana and Texas was actually uh, a hardwood belt, similar to what you might see in the Ohio River Valley area. That hardwood belt was here only 7,000 years ago, only 7,000 years ago, not millions of years ago. So this area would have been in hardwood, and this is somewhat of a remnant, remnant of that and reminiscent of the hardwoods that would be in the foothills of the South Carolina mountains. You got all the hardwoods we have, walnut, uh, American beech, yellow poplar, all those species that are here as well as undergrowth to let us know that things were different here a long time ago. And in behind me you can see some dwarf palmetto. That's not the sable palmetto which is a South Carolina state tree. It's a dwarf palmetto that stays uh, roughly about that size. Interesting place, interesting story, and more walnuts falling all around us, so we got to be careful. We'll move on to the next spot. Well, here we are back to take a little bit closer look at the uh, pine plantation that we established after harvesting the original pine plantation, which was 42 years old at harvest. So we harvested in 2016 and uh, let the uh, competition resprout. Then we used herbicide to control as much of the competing vegetation as possible and then planted in February of 2018. So it's had growing seasons of 18, 19 and now finishing up with year 20. And you can see that some of them have done extremely well. This is the best one that I can find out here. The typical is about uh, 10 feet or so in three years, so a little over three feet a year. But this particular one here is 17 and a half feet tall and the diameter at four and a half feet breast height is a little over three inches. So this is gonna be our uh, specimen for what can really, really happen in an environment like this. And you see these trees all look real good. What they hope to do, uh, me being 67 years old, is to hang around now and be able to thin them at about 12 or 13 years old, thin them again in another five years, and then, thin, and then harvest again at say 22 to 25 if I'm here. I'll be able to harvest them. If I'm not here, the um, next owner, whether it be my sons or my family, they can harvest them and enjoy the asset. Thinking about, once again, SAF, Excellence in Sustainable Forestry, doing things for society in perpetuity. That's what we do. We establish things, make things better for the generations to come. All right, we want to kind of close out our conversation today about uh, forest land ownership, small private landowners, Society of American Foresters, and uh, excellence in sustainable forestry by talking a little bit about the generations. We talked about planning, making things better for the future, better for the next generations. And I think this is a really good example of that, wherein you have the, the stump here that you remember we harvested at 42 years old. It's about uh, 27 inches in diameter. And right beside it, there's a seedling that's three years old and about nine, nine feet. 
And uh, the illustration here, I think, means it shows that uh, the 67-year-old forester like myself, who's been blessed to be in this business for over 40 years, can move on to other things. We have young foresters coming on. SAF has an active program to uh, recruit youngsters into forestry. Uh, we want the brightest and the best to come in and help us out to move forward, to move us forward on our mission of uh, that excellence in forestry and creating a legacy that will make it better for society in perpetuity. And thank you for being with us today on our Walnut Bluff Tree Farm.